Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Well, to maybe hear you in the chat or reading the chat, shall I say. It's nice to see everyone from the presenters. So let's get started. This is a topic that various community members have been asking about and have been uh, wondering, when can we run Dagger inside a container? September 20th, 2022. Kajogo, he's the one that kicked it off. We had the cool drop. Uh, Chopan PMA. Ah, I'm not sure how, if I'm pronouncing it right, but there we go. Cool drop again. Miranda was there, Ryan, J11, Sonara. So a couple of community members wondering about this. And while we have been tackling it in various formats, this is where a bunch of things are coming together. So that was a community call. I think it was uh, June 1st. And if you remember, we were preparing for a talk, the Equinix demo day, and this was a forcing function, just, you know, making sure we are ready, getting a couple of things done, um, rehearsing, so on and so forth. If you remember in that talk, there was like one thing that I was asking people not to do is how not to run Dagger in Kubernetes. So if there's anything to remember from that talk, it was like how not to do it mostly. Uh, soon after that, um, we had a lot of feedback, so thank you to those that contributed. Uh, there was Hugo, how to connect securely from GitHub Actions. Obviously, this was uh, an important thing, and again, we were not doing it right June 1st. Uh, Daniel Oliveira, he was just as you are now in the audience, and he was wondering if uh, um, instead of having a single beefy Dagger pod, can he have a cluster of Dagger pods running behind the service uh, so that he can scale horizontally all valid points. So a lot of people asking questions, very helpful, uh, keep it coming. Thank you very much. So that was June. Towards the end, we had the Equinix demo day. That talk is available online, by the way, on YouTube. You can go and check it out. Uh, it was a bit more polished. You know, we had a couple more things going. And I think the most interesting thing is if I go a bit further, let's see, where was that happening? Uh, we had Kyle as well. So Kyle is here with us. Um, I think that's going to come a bit later. So that's okay. Yeah. So um, in the demo day, what we wanted is to basically create a, a next step, like a, a sequence, like a follow-up. So one of the next steps when we gave the talk was to follow up in a Dagger community call. So that's what's happening right now. This is the follow-up to the demo day. We We have a couple more things to share. So that's what's happening today. Um, I think the most important thing is a blog post that we're still working towards and we'll, we are getting together. And that's the one that will be available on the blog, hopefully today, hopefully tomorrow. Um, what does that look like? Well, here is a preview of what it will be available when it will be published. Dagger on Kubernetes. Uh, the hardest part was choosing this image, by the way. So I'm sure that you will appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, couple of like high levels, why you, why you may want to do this. The most interesting thing for me, it was this diagram. And this is all Joel. So just to tie things together, there's a pull request. This is public on the Dagger repo 5446 that Joel started. And that's where we have the diagram. So this is where I uh, ask Joel to tell us more about what, 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 what are you thinking, Joel, basically, with, with this pull request? What, what can we expect here? Yeah, so the basic um, intent of the pull request and the docs are just going to be kind of describing how we think about um, running Dagger on Kubernetes and some of the constraints um, that we're putting kind of on our implementation. Um, also, uh, Connor, who just posted in chat, um, we worked uh, pretty closely with Connor. Let's see who all was that. That was me and Eric and Kyle helped um, and the rest of the Dagger team to kind of help structure their implementation of Dagger on Kubernetes. Um, so let's see, I'd say, so a few of the things that I think are important to note is just how we're thinking about um, cash for Dagger. Um, and a lot of uh, the speed ups that people generally get with Dagger are from a local cache um, running against, so the build kit cache that gets um, created by the Dagger engine. Um, so one of the things that we did with our implementation was to try to optimize 
for um, getting that to stick around for at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so we're trying to balance kind of caching and um, scaling up from zero because you no, don't necessarily want to have um, nodes in your Kubernetes cluster that are sticking around for you know days and days and days. Um, so that's kind of that's one of the basic um, design constraints. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll speak to that. Um, we'll speak a little bit to one of the things that we're um, using in the context of uh, our implementation and Airbyte's implementation, which is uh, Dagger Cloud Cache. Um, which I think we'll talk about more later. Um, and that's basically a way to help us uh, maintain cache while being able to scale down to zero um, mm -hmm. on those nodes. Um, yeah, are there yeah. any other things that you'd like me to? Well, in this to? diagram, I was trying to wonder if I was to call out a couple of components. So what yeah. goes into this? I think there are a couple of gotchas here. And uh, obviously, we will expand on this, but this is you know, where, where we got to so far. So in this case, we're looking at an EKS cluster, so Kubernetes yep. managed by, by, by AWS. Um, in terms of key components, we have the GitHub Actions Arc, the Actions Runner Controller. Uh, that's the one that manages the self-hosted runners. I think what's interesting here is that we have Carpenter. And Carpenter is responsible for this, like scaling out and scaling back in when, when there isn't any, any demand. So I'm wondering, first of all, like how well does it work in practice? Because I remember you demoing it at some point. I forget the link. Uh, maybe we can link a bit later. There was a video about this. Yep. Uh, it works quite well. Um, and it does all the things that you were describing. It basically is watching um, the GitHub Actions uh, API for mm -hmm. runs um, that are tagged with specific names. It could be self-hosted, or in our case, we usually use like Dagger Runner or um, size Dagger Runner with like some number of CPUs, um, memory, that kind of thing. Um, and then it'll place that job in the GitHub Actions, um, in GitHub Actions on one of these runners. Right. And then Carpenter, like you mentioned, is basically watching for pods that are created by the GitHub Actions runner controller and um, if they're not schedulable because there's not a node that they can be placed on, it will um, quite rapidly spin up a node using the EC2 APIs, connect that to the uh, EKS control plane, mm -hmm. and then those pods will get play, uh, scheduled and start running and you know, connect back to the GitHub Actions API and uh, start actually running those workflows. Um, mm -hmm. That are described in the you know GitHub Actions workflow YAML. Okay, um, so yeah. so this basically would address the two points uh, that were mentioned during uh, the last community call when we presented that that was June first. Is first of all how to uh, have more than one Dagger engine running, and this is where we see that we have more uh, being scheduled, and the other was around security. So how do we ensure that the runner itself connects securely to the engine? So in this diagram, how does that work? Yeah, so um, we one of the constraints that I mentioned earlier, which was around um, caching and specifically maintaining the local cache, mm -hmm. um, had us drive towards having just one dagger engine per node. Um, so multiple runners will um, run against that single dagger engine. Um, and the way that those, the way that workflows that are running inside of those runners, so, you know, inside of each of these uh, GHA runners, mm -hmm. there's going to be one or more Dagger um, pipelines that are going to be run typically. Mm -hmm. And um, they're connecting over a Unix socket that's mounted um, from that Dagger daemon set into each of those runners. Um, and we're currently using... Uh, experimental, um, although we've used it pretty heavily, so it's not so experimental anymore, um, environment variable, which allows us to point uh, the Dagger CLI and Dagger pipelines uh, that are being run you know, via an SDK at a particular Dagger host, which in this case happens to be the one that's running on that same Kubernetes node. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. 
So if uh, folks are interested to find out more or just keep an eye on this, this is pull request 5446. It's in the Dagger Dagger public repo. You can go check it out. Uh, there's a bunch more that will be added soon. Um, and again, let's see what is useful, what is missing, so that we can get it, this out there publicly. Uh, it can be on Docs. I'm thinking Docs Dagger IO. It will definitely be in this repo, but Docs Dagger IO is what we're thinking. And uh, yeah, I think that wraps it up nicely. The other thing, again, going back to the demo, uh, we talked about how to convert a pipeline that had lots of YAML, a real world open source project. This was Go Releaser. And Carl was talking about how he did the conversion. So from lots and lots of YAML to some beautiful Go here using the Dagger pipeline. And we did it. I say we, it was Kyle. Kyle opened the pull request. So there's a contribution now in the Go Releaser project 4186, you can go and check it out, that uh, captures this um, conversion. Kyle, do you want us, do you want to run us through it? Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, if you check out the uh, the other talk that um, the Gerhard was just talking about, we kind of dig into the details of what this code looks like. And we looked at that um, previously in another uh, community call as well. Um, yeah, I just linked out to Marcos's tweet here that has a little bit of information and a link to the video. Um, and so one of the cool things about this change is that uh, previously to, to test changes in Go Releaser locally, if you're um, developing a new feature or changing some, uh, some things, it required a lot of dependencies on your machine. So there was like this list of uh, I think six or seven things and that might not have been fully complete and that's like an ever changing thing. And how do you know you have the right versions of all these things? And so by moving the whole pipeline into Dagger, it means that um, all of the contributors to Go Releaser don't need to worry about um, all these different dependencies that the tests require, right? So if you go down to, I think the contrib contributing markdown, uh, you can see the change here in um, what you actually need on your machine to run the tests. Uh, so that I think should be like a huge improvement uh, as well as, you know, just the runtime of the pipeline instead of taking 10 minutes to go through. Um, if you have most of these dependencies cached and you're just making a simple change to go releaser, it's probably like a minute or two to run instead of 10 minutes. Um, and if it's all cached, I think it's pretty much instant. Uh, we mm -hmm. saw the same thing in CI. And again, we dig a bit more into the numbers in that video. Um, but yeah, running in GitHub Actions for Go Releasers CI, uh, the time should be pretty similar to what they were before just because that uh, they're not going to have any caching set up on their GitHub Actions side. But for the, 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 the developer experience, um, for actually working on Go Releaser, I think should be improved quite a bit with this change. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this, this PR is open and uh, we can link it here in the, uh, the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I'm very curious to see what happens next with this. If Carlos is watching this, maybe not now, maybe playing it back. I'm very curious to hear what you think, Carlos, about it. Carlos is the Go Releaser maintainer. And uh, yeah, thank you, Marcos, for helping out with this because uh, there was like some back and forth, making sure that, you know, this um, lands nicely. And again, whatever happens next, it's out there. So, okay. Well, uh, this is local. The blog post is still being written. Um, it will have all the links. That's why um, we'll obviously we'll share a few in the chat, but really all of this will be available on uh, Dagger IO blog uh, once we go through the reviews, once we finish it. So that's where you can expect uh, for it to appear as soon as that's done. And if you have any questions, we can take them now. I have a quick question. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm abusing my, my panelist slot to ask it live. Sure. Uh, I, I I know it's been discussed in the in the past whether it's possible to drop the um, the dagger engine daemon set uh, alongside the um, GitHub Actions runner or CI runner um, uh, as is without mm -hmm. requiring running a modified version of that CI runner. The mm -hmm. modification being about how it can find and properly connect to the the dagger engine. And you know that the the discussion just boiled down to is there a mechanism in Kubernetes that allows that sort of a you know runtime injection in a way that's both production safe and uh, gets the job done? 
Uh, and I'm just curious if that discussion has reached a conclusion, if we think it's possible, if it's still TBD, because that would be really cool if you could just drop drop Dagger and Kubernetes and your CI renderers just can use them as is, right? Um, we haven't dug too much, <clears throat> uh, much uh, more deeply into that than when we last talked about it. Um, I think there probably are ways that we could do that. Um, generally, I'd say my preference uh, would be to not like do some like runtime change of, you know, basically don't do mutating webhooks or anything along those lines, like try and figure out a mechanism by which we could utilize Kubernetes, the Kubernetes tooling um, to make that happen. I think that should be possible, um, but we haven't dug too uh, deep into it yet. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep, uh, I'll, I'll keep the, the faith. Uh... Yeah, I mean, the change is relatively straightforward um, currently. It's a couple of lines of addition to the GitHub runner. Um, so it shouldn't be terrible um, to add it, but it would be cool to make it so that it... Yeah, especially, I'm, just, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm picturing scenarios where, uh, well, maybe, maybe it's, I'm picturing it being more friction than it actually is, meaning that this would be less needed than I'm imagining, but I'm picturing, you know, a team that's running maybe a specific version of the runner and they 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 can't just follow main or or maybe maintaining the that patch is just you know just a little a little bit of an extra burden because when you're updating you have to kind of reapply the patch each time and I, i'm i haven't myself done it operationally so maybe it's way easier than i'm picturing i'm just i'm just assuming if we magically found a way to drop it in and it doesn't have you know a terrible cost like it's insecure or you know unreliable that it would be appreciated to not have to touch the runner, the CI runner at all, but you know, not at any cost. So of course it's a trade-off. I'm just curious um, where, you know, yeah, I was just curious, but now I know. TBD. Yeah, there's um, a little bit of discussion in there, in the, uh, in the chat as well about, you know, how we could possibly run run these things, you know, different approaches, sidecars and et cetera. So um, definitely a, a, a rich area, right? That I know we're going to be looking into documenting more. Yeah, yeah, I feel that merging that PR, by the way, and getting the docs out there and having more people see it, probably that will get more people thinking about ways to improve it. And so probably that's the, you know, that that's the path to um, finding the answer is just getting what we have out there and getting lots of eyeballs on it and um, working on it uh, with the community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just like another Very step cool. in a journey and we know it's long. We know rootless and Ipuna, I can see he mentioned that rootless and non-privileged that is high on the list and that is a hard problem. And I refer to Eric because he knows what goes into this and there's a few comments in various issues. It's, it's not easy. You can find them by the way. Uh, maybe we can follow up with a link, but uh, thank you, Nipuna. I will make sure to add a link about the discussion. There's there's some specific comments that that, that Eric dropped uh, that are again hard problems that we have to solve. Um, as in, it should be done. Yes, important, but it's not an easy thing. It's not like flipping a flag or changing a couple of uh, configuration options and everything will work. Not sure if you want to mention anything about that, Eric, but. Yeah, I was just looking for that GitHub issue. But yeah, basically it becomes like dependent on the kernel version of the host for a lot of features. Um, you can, if you have an old enough kernel, it might work, but the performance will be so bad that it's unusable. Um, it, it, Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really important. And I think as time goes on and, you know, kernels become more and more updated, it'll get a lot easier too. So it's definitely something we care about. Yeah. Again, I started looking for this now. Maybe I shouldn't have, but again, this, this came up a couple of times. So yeah, it is, it is there on the list. Cool. Got well, it. If there aren't any more questions, then I'm happy to stop sharing and uh, thank you very much.